are ever so close to learning Hooke's Law, and perhaps we know a little bit more about Hooke's Law than we initially thought. Do you recall anything about stress and strain, any formulas we might be able to use? Hopefully you remember stress sigma is equal to P over A. And strain is equal to delta L over L zero. Now I'm gonna rewrite delta L as little delta. This is the elongation or the delta L of our one-dimensional axial stretch. All right, so that tells us a little bit about stress and strain. Did we have a way of relating stress and strain? A lot of engineering depends upon being able to relate stress to strain. Well, of course, we know we can run a stress-strain test to get that relationship. But more particularly, we remember that in the linear elastic range, sigma is equal to E epsilon, where capital E is Young's modulus, or the slope of that linear elastic range. It's important to note that this, though, only applies in the linear elastic range. All right, if that's the case, I just want to plug in some of these variables. We'll substitute P over A for sigma. We'll substitute delta over L zero for strain. And then I want to solve for delta. So ultimately, we are after the deflection delta. And delta is going to equal P L divided by E A. So this is a way of solving for deflections of a one-dimensional member in the linear elastic range. If you want to remember it, remember before you walk the plank, you have to plea with the person who is forcing you off, the captain of the ship, P L over E A. This works for a constant load and constant cross-section. But we said in our learning objectives that we wish to generalize this for any given case. So we wanted to be able to generalize this. So we can write from this, we can just write this as an integral. Now we're going to replace this with an integral and we're going to integrate along the length of the member then we could say that delta at any given point can be defined as the integral of a function of the load over the length divided by E, and our modulus can vary across the length, and our area can vary across the length. And so this gives us a way of varying the properties, more specifically maybe at any point x, we would go from zero to point x to come up with the values of all of these, and we could then come up with a general formula if we have a function. So this might be a crazier function. But a lot of times we have defined point loads, we have a defined cross-sectional area, one material, so by and large, this formula will be very useful to us. Now that we know Hook's Law, it's time to hoist our flag and raise it proud. This is the flag that all pirates fly under. Law. Let's go ahead and solve an example problem. Before we do that, we have to first define some sort of sign convention. Now, of course, if you took statics class previously, you probably used this sign convention. But regardless, this is the sign convention that we will live by, the code we will abide by as pirates. Tension, positive. Tension represents if we make a cut, the force is directed away from the cut. Compression force is directed towards the cut. This is our sign convention. So let's apply that to our problem. Problem 
asks us to calculate the deflection of the steel rod at points A, B, C, and D. The rod has a diameter of 0.5 inches, and we're told to take the modulus of elasticity to be 29,000 KSI, so it's probably steel. All right, we have some loads applied, we have the cross-section, we have some lengths, dimensions, the diameter. Now we need to get solving this. So, we know our motto. Hooke's Law is PL over EA. So we always remember our formula and that's what we wish to solve. So we know delta equals PL over EA. So we have information about the length, modulus of elasticity, and of course the area. But how do we solve for P? So P is going to be our axial force at any given point along the member. So let's start here in segment AB. What is the axial force in AB? All right, well we have a bunch of loads going on and it's hard to tell. Uh, is it five kips? No, it is most definitely not five kips. Just because this is the closest load does not mean it is the load in this piece. Right? We have a fixed end and we have a bunch of loads happening over here. So we have to factor in all of these loads to figure out what the internal axial force is in AB. You know from statics how to do this. Free body diagrams. Exactly. So let's go ahead and draw a free body diagram in segment AB. I make my cut, and I'm going to loop my cut around to the outside. So I wish to make a free body diagram of a cut in AB. So if I look at this free body diagram, I see inside I have my cut, I have a rod, I have loads applied, I have an 8 kip load at the end, at point D, at point C, I have a 10 kip load, at B, I have a 5 kip load to the right. And then what do I do at my cut? Well, we said we adopted a sign convention and tension was positive. So we're going to draw our force in the positive direction. Positive is away from the cut. So I'll insert my force on my cut, and this is going to be my axial force in segment AB. All right, first free body diagram. Number two, equilibrium. So this is how we solve pretty much every static problem out there. So we come in here and we want to look at our equilibrium equations. We see for this one-dimensional rod, the equilibrium equation we want to use is some forces in the x direction. I'll take positive to the right. So this gives me a positive 8, negative 10, positive 5, negative PAV has to equal 0. All right, so we have our equation. We can solve now for the axial force in AB. Bring that to the other side, we see that PAB equals, let's see, eight minus 10 is negative two, plus five is positive three. So we get three kips. Because it's a positive number, that means this is in tension. So the axial force in segment AB is three kips in tension. All right, hopefully that makes sense to you from the statics point of view. Uh, we can then, we have to come up with the axial force in all of these segments. But perhaps uh, you're still wondering why is it three kips? Well, let's kind of dive deeper. I think we're getting so ever so close to fully understanding Hooke's Law. What's that? Land ahead. This is where Hooke's Law is said to be located. Let's go see if he's left us anything.
All right, we are ever so close to finding the treasure. I think if we follow this map, it's somewhere in this vicinity. I think it's over here. All right, time to get to digging. What is that? I see something. Could this be it? Is this what we've been searching for? It says hooks workout log. What could that mean? Well, let's take a look inside. Boy, is it hot out there. Let's see what hook left us. It says hooks workout log. And it seems he left us some sort of log and oh, one of those fitness bands. Let's look at his log. It says Utensio seek vis. You know what that means? Well, luckily I studied my Latin and it means as the extension, so the force. So, Hook in his fabled paper from 1660 said, Utensio seek vis. Basically, he was describing that with the force, the tension, the extension was related to the force proportionally. In that case, the proportion had to do with the length, the modulus of elasticity in the area. Hook might not have known that, but he was on to the right track. It seemed he also did a lot of exercises like pull-ups, some flies, um, dips, curls, that's good. Oh, he definitely did shrugs. Um, uh-oh, I don't know. I'm not sure if he did leg, legs on this day. That might not be good. Never forget leg day. But he seemed to have left us these bands. And so what can we do with these bands to come up with our model our problem? So it seems like maybe we can model this problem with this band. So let's go ahead and see if we can do that. So if we take a look at our example problem, here I fixed my band at point A, and then I'll represent the eight kips of force at point D over here. If we only had the load at point D, right, we would know that the axial force all along the length was eight kips in tension, right? So I think we can see that. Now I'm going to apply the load at point C. So at point C, we had 10 kips, but the 10 kips was acting towards point A. So if I come in here and I pull and I start applying 10 kips, I see that I still have eight kips of tension between point C and D. However, because I put 10 kips towards point A, you can see that I developed a little bit of slack between C and A. And in fact, that would be compression. Now, since our bands can't take compression, it just kind of slacks up. And you would see that the net result would be eight kips of tension, but 10 kips compression. So then we would say that this segment had two kips compression. Now, continuing that out, if I only had three hands, gotta go find one of my crazy uh, pirates on my ship. One of them has to have three hands, right? Here, you would then have five kips more of tension. So, then we could think about this problem. I like to think of it, we could always draw the free body diagrams. That always works. But I would rather kind of think, if this is my anchor point, I'm gonna follow my load back to my anchor point. Eight kips of tension, and then I have 10 kips compression. So that gives me two kips of compression in my next segment. Two kips of compression, plus five kips of tension, would then give me three kips of tension in this last segment. And that is what we calculated using our free body diagrams. So if you like to do it the visual method, great. If you don't, then go ahead and make free body diagrams in each of your segments to get those loads. We're gonna combine all this into what we call an axial force diagram to help us with solving these problems. So hopefully you follow the logic from that demonstration. We want to draw an axial force diagram. This is much like a shear moment diagram, uh, but just for axial force. Now, typically we give axial force the variable n, so I'll use that to stay consistent. 
And then I'll label my points along the length. So I have points A, point B, point C, and then point D. Now we want to come up with the axial force in each segment. Now, we already solved the axial force in segment AB with three kips of tension. So like I said before, if you want to just draw a free body diagram of each portion, go for it. You'll get three different values and you can plot those on our axial force diagram. So I'll plot three kips of tension. I'll denote tension by showing my positive sign convention. So I'll draw a little rectangle with my arrows pulling it at its end, indicating that it's three kips of tension. Now how do we figure out what was in B, C, and C, D? Well, I said I like to work from the end. So if I think about the end, I want to see what's going on just in segment C, D. So I'm imagining in my head I make a cut here, and I would just draw a free body diagram for this segment. It's kind of easy to see that my free body diagram would yield eight kips of tension for this particular segment. I can see that eight kips pulling on it, I would have to have eight kips of force to the left on that free body diagram to make it uh, stay in equilibrium. So I know in this segment I have eight kips tension from C to D. <clears throat> but then I accumulate eight kips of tension and I have this ten kips of compression at C. So when I look at a free body diagram here, I have eight to the right, but 210 to the left, so that would be 2 to the left. So I would need 2 to the right, or what would be a negative 2, uh, if we draw in our proper sign convention. So I see that I have 2 kips of compression on that segment. So again, in this segment, 8 kips tension, 10 kips compression, causes a net value of 2 kips compression. And so we saw that by the sagging in the band when we are applying all those forces in that demonstration. So I know in this segment we have negative two kips and that was compression. And then I'm just going to connect them. The force is constant between the two points. So I have straight lines. Then we have a sudden jump and a sudden jump. Here I'll indicate compression by showing our rectangle being compressed. And now we have our axial force diagram. So hopefully that helps you. This will be useful because as we apply PL over EA at different stages, we can reference the force from our axial force diagram. So now that we have our axial force diagram, we want to finish solving the problem. We want to solve for the deflections at points A, B, C, and D. So we'll start with the deflection at A. So whereas with the forces, it's easier to come kind of from the free end and work our way back to the fixed support. With the flexions, it's best to go from our point of fixity and kind of head the opposite direction, at least for statically determinate systems. So my deflection at point A is zero, right? Because A is a fixed end. You see A is a fixed end, so I have my deflection at A equals zero. I'll just note that it's a fixed end. And we have our first answer. If only they were all that easy, right? Next we'll look at the deflection at B. Deflection at B is equal to the deflection that occurred at A plus the deflection of B relative to point A. So this would be my nomenclature where I would be describing that the deflection, the total amount of deflection at B is equal to whatever happened at A plus the change from B to A. So this is what we call a compatibility equation and we'll talk more about that in the next lesson. Um, but hopefully this makes sense to you. Now this delta B relative to A is the value we want to calculate. So we know that delta B relative to A 
is equal to PL over EA for segment AB. And so this is Hooke's law. And so all we have to do now is plug in the values for P, L, E, and A. So more specifically, force the axial force in AB, the length of AB over EAB, AAB. All right, so what are our values? We said that the axial force from A to B was three kips of tension. So positive three kips. Our length, our length from A to B is 10 inches. E was given to us as 29,000 KSI. And then A, pi over four times our diameter, which is 0.5 inches squared. Let me go ahead and make this a bracket so we know that this was our value for A. And so doing this calculation, we can come up with the amount for delta B relative to A. So go ahead and plug in your calculators. You should get 0 0.00527 inches. 0 0.00527 inches. It's a positive number, so that means it's going to be extension or that our point is moving to the right. So if you look back to our original problem, because AB is in tension, B is shifting to the right by a value of 0 0.005270 inches. Now, strictly speaking, we'll plug this back up into this equation. Uh, but remember, delta A was zero because it was a fixed end. So now we can get to our result. Delta B equals 0 0.005270 0 inches to the right. There we go, we're on our way to solving Hooke's Law. Let's try point C. So point C follows the same steps as point B. Delta at point C is equal to the deflection at point P plus the change of C relative to B. So this is going to equal my total amount from the delta B, which we said was 0 0.00527 inches, plus delta C relative to B, which we said is Hooke's law for segment BC. So we'll have plus PBC, LBC over EBC, ABC. So this gives us a value of, this remains the same, 
delta C is 0 0.001757 inches. 00 1757, five, five, sorry. 57 five, inches. Positive number still indicates that it has shifted to the right, but we see that delta C is not as far to the right as delta B was, and that's because we had contraction over that next segment. Alright, so I hope this is making sense to you. I want you guys to go ahead and try the deflection at point D. So now come up with the deflection at the very end of that rod. Follow the same procedure, making sure that in our formula for the axial force, we always want to use the axial force on that segment alone, and we get that force from our axial force diagram. All right, so hopefully you did deflection at D and you got something like this. Right, you can go ahead and pause the video if you'd like to make sure your notes are correct. Um, but if you did the calculations, uh, you should have got 0 0.028106 inches for just the extension of segment CD. And adding that to the deflection at C gives us a total deflection of 0 0.029863 inches. And that is acting to the right. So point D would be shifting to the right. All right, hopefully that makes sense. We've now answered all the parts to this question. I want to just take you through the geometry. So if you want to just make sure you're understanding what's happening to the geometry, go ahead and uh, finish up this video. All right, so I just want to make sure we have the difference between something like delta C relative to B versus what delta C is. So one is just the elongation or movement relative to another point of one segment whereas the other is like a final change from the original spot. So we saw that for delta B relative to A, the value we calculated was 0 0.005270 inches. So that means in our displaced geometry, segment AB is now 10 inches plus that change. So it's now 10.005270 inches. Likewise, for segment BC, we take 10 inches and we now subtract 0 0.003513 inches. So that leaves us with a final dimension between points B and C of 9.996487 inches. Finally, for C to D, we add delta T D relative to C to our initial length, and we see that the distance is now uh, between C and D is 20.0. 028106 inches. Now, the difference is delta D. Delta D we calculated was 0 0.029863 inches to the right. So if we were now looking kind of at the global picture from A to D, that's the total change, delta D. And then if we look at the total length, we see that the total length is 40 inches. So our final elongated length is 40.029863 inches. And in fact, if we added up all those little segments, those three segments in between there, we would get to the same value. Hopefully that clears up any confusion you might have had on the relative deltas versus the total displacement at a particular point. That's it for this portion of our adventure. I'll see you in the next example problem.